Hi guys, I hope you're all doing really well. Welcome back to What The Horror, the channel where we talk about horror movies old and new. Last week we talked about Alex Garland's latest movie, Men, which was certainly an interesting experience. This week though, we're doing another summer horror top 10 list. It's been a couple of weeks now since the last one, so I thought it was high time for another. The last list was a collection of general summer horror movies, those films that are perfect to watch through summer months, whether that's summer at home, summer by the sea, or summer at camp. I'll leave a link to the summer horror playlist here and in the description box, so don't forget to check out the others. This time we're talking about the top 10 camping horror movies. I've got a whole range of choices for you as well. There's camping in tents, camping in cabins, camping at summer camps, and we've even got camping in trailers or caravans, depending on what you call them. So rather than timestamping each individual movie, I'm going to group them into the different types of camping and then timestamp those. So if you are looking for a specific type of camping horror movie, you can just jump ahead to the one that you want. So let's start our camping horror movie list with a trip to summer camp and kicking off this list, let's just get it out of the way. It's Friday the 13th, probably the most well-known and well-loved summer camp horror movie. And I imagine no surprise to you guys. You could choose any number of the films from the Friday the 13th franchise from part one, part two, part three, part six, and the 2009 remake. But for the sake of this list, I'm choosing Friday the 13th, part two, released in 1981. After surviving the events of the first movie, a traumatized Alice becomes the victim of a mysterious assailant while at home. Years later, a group of camp counselors head to a new camp at Crystal Lake, unaware of the danger that awaits them. After the success of the original Friday the 13th, Paramount Pictures decided to go ahead with a sequel. In fact, they already had a long-term plan to release a new Friday movie on a yearly basis and have it be a big event for its audiences. A lot like Saw and Paranormal Activity did releasing a new movie every Halloween. Friday the 13th Part 2 has possibly one of horror's most popular final girls. After Adrian King was unfortunately stalked by an obsessed fan after the release of the original movie, she asked for her role to be much smaller in the sequel. So, the final girl baton was passed to Amy Steele, who plays Ginny, Part 2's final girl. Ginny is intelligent, endearing, and displays a lot of ingenuity. I think Ginny is definitely some people's favourite aspect of the film. Not everyone is a fan of the sackhead look of Jason in part two, and I don't personally mind it. Look, if I'm looking for a Jason hit, I'll check out one of the later entries when he's rocking that casual DIY sportswear look. What I watch part two for is the setting and the characters. Part two actually has characters that I like, and I enjoy watching them before they turn into kill fodder. And the setting is perfect for summer watching. You've got gorgeous sunny days at the, likes, at the lakeside camp where they're swimming in the lake, running in the woods, they're enjoying barbecues, and they're telling ghost stories around a cozy campfire. Friday the 13th part two is one of my favorite summer rewatches. Next up, we have Sleepaway Camp, released in 1983. Yes, I know this is a repeat as I included it in my top 10 summer horror movies list, but this is perfect for this list because it's set in a summer camp where the kids are, you know, camping. After a horrible boating accident kills her family, shy Angela moves in with her aunt and cousin Ricky. One summer, they head to Camp Arawak and shortly after arrival, people begin getting killed off one by one. Sleepaway Camp is set at a summer camp like Friday the 13th, but what I love about this film is that we actually have a range of characters from camp counsellors to actual campers. We follow the characters as they actually use the camp, and I think that it makes the movie more interesting to have that interwound with the killings. It makes for a much more interesting watch. I said in my last top 10 list that I wait for it, personally think this is a stronger movie than Friday the 13th, and I stand by that. Sleepaway Camp is bizarre, fun, and unintentionally hilarious. There is some absolutely choice dialogue in this film, and it had me laughing out loud so many times. There's just so much to love here, from the crazy short shots to an unexplained six minute long baseball game in the middle of the movie, to the camp leader's dramatic soliloquies. 
And like Friday the 13th part two, sleepaway camp has the perfect summer setting. Gorgeous sunny days frolicking in the lake and loads of just general summer activities. But while I love this movie and its campy nature and creative kills, it should be said that this is an 80s slasher movie and is very much a product of the time. Some of the characters' actions and lines are questionable, most notably the, um, the chef of the camp, so just bear that in mind if you do watch it. Next up, and the final summer camp instalment on this list, is Fear Street 1978, the second instalment in the Fear Street trilogy and released on Netflix in 2021. Shadyside, 1978. School's out for summer and the activities at Camp Nightwing are about to begin. But when another shady sider is possessed with the urge to kill, the fun in the sun becomes a gruesome fight for survival. We're back at summer camp and while I wasn't expecting much from the release of the Fear Street trilogy last year, I ended up really loving 1978. While the first film paid homage to 90s slashes like Scream, this one took it back to the days of classic camp horror such as Friday the 13th and Sleepaway Camp. What's great about 1978 is that while it is the middle entry in a trilogy, I think it works well enough as a standalone movie to be able to just watch it on its own merits. So if you don't want to invest in the whole trilogy, I think you'd be able to dip into this one and still have a good time. 1978 also has my favourite characters from the trilogy, headed up by the phenomenally talented Sadie Sink of Stranger Things fame. The characters are interesting and likeable and with gory kills, a stellar 70s soundtrack and a warm toned summer setting, this is a fun watch with lots to keep you entertained. Next up, we're moving into camping in Cabins in the Wood and what other movie could start this section off other than The Evil Dead, directed and written by Sam Raimi and released in 1981. Ash Williams, his girlfriend and three pals drive into the woods to a cabin for a fun night away. There they find an old book, the Necronomicon, whose text reawakens the dead when it's read aloud. The friends inadvertently release a flood of evil and must fight for their lives or become one of the evil dead. The evil dead spawned a really successful and popular franchise consisting of two sequels, a remake in 2013 and a TV series called Ash vs Evil Dead but it all began here with The Evil Dead. Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell had been friends for a long time, having grown up together, and the pair made a few low-budget projects but wanted to break into the horror genre. The Evil Dead was apparently originally called The Book of the Dead, and I love the fact that they basically got the funding for this movie from their friends and family. The original Evil Dead has a lot of the same gritty brutality that the Texas Chainsaw Massacre has and is often well known for some of its notorious scenes, including one involving an over-familiar tree, we'll say, but there is a lot to love about the Evil Dead, including the incredible practical effects and the introduction of one of horror's greatest final boys, Ash Williams. If the darkness of the original isn't for you, then you can always try Evil Dead 2, which while being a sequel also kind of acts as a reboot of the original, but it removes certain scenes and certain characters. Evil Dead 2 is also possibly more iconic than the original. A lot of the fans favour the slapstick goofiness of the sequel, and this is the movie where Ash Williams becomes the Ash Williams that most people know and love. Next up, we have Cabin in the Woods, directed by Drew Goddard and released in 2011. When five college friends arrive at a remote forest cabin for a little vacation, little do they expect the horrors that await them. One by one, the youths fall victim to backwoods zombies, but there is another factor at play. Two scientists are manipulating the ghoulish goings-on, but even as the body count rises, there is yet more at work than meets the eye. Cabin in the Woods is classed as a comedy horror, and while that isn't my favourite subgenre of horror, I do enjoy this movie. I think that the humour that they attempt actually lands, and it never veers too far into being ridiculous. I mean, maybe one or two scenes are ridiculous, but they're ridiculous while still being good. 
It was co-written by Drew Goddard and Josh Whedon, who had previously worked together on Buffy the Vampire Layer. <laughs> Sorry, I mean Slayer, and the spin-off show Angel. While I've heard some call the movie a love letter to horror, I read that Josh Whedon calls it a loving hate letter to the genre. It's an accumulation of things that the creators love and hate about horror movies. So while delivering on thrills and scares, it also passes commentary on those annoying tropes that had become so commonplace. And this commenting on familiar horror tropes and the obvious inspiration taken from other movies, including the aforementioned Evil Dead, makes it a really fun watch for fans of the horror genre. While I'm not really a huge fan of comedy horror, there are three movies that I think do it well. And two of those films are included in this list. The first of those was Cabin in the Woods, and the second is Tucker and Dale vs. Evil, released in 2010. Tucker and Dale decide to go on a vacation to their holiday home cabin in the mountains, but their vacation takes a nasty turn when they are mistaken for chainsaw killers by a group of college students. I struggle to get on board with a lot of comedy horror movies as I just don't think they're always done well, and humour is a very personal thing. And so what one person may think is funny, another may not. But I personally think that Tucker and Dale is a really good example of comedy horror done well. This movie is genuinely funny, sweet, and a really fun watch. Are you okay? Like Cabin in the Woods, the humour in Tucker and Dale is found in its poking fun at overused horror tropes. In fact, the whole of the movie's story kind of relies on the audience having knowledge of these tropes. But where Tucker and Dale differs to Cabin in the Woods is how it also manages to include and tackle other topics such as prejudice, um, judging people based on their appearance alone, and situations being created due to the simple lack of communication. This movie delivers on the camping twofold, as you have the young adults camping in tents, but you also have Tucker and Dale in their holiday home cabin. And while the young adult characters aren't exactly worth writing home about, the two leads, Tucker and Dale, more than make up for that. These two are one of my favourite movie duos. They're so endearing and the two actors that play them have such great chemistry um, that that really helps sell their genuinely touching bromance. All right, now for some movies that are a mixture of walking and hiking in the woods and camping in tents. First up, we have The Ritual, directed by David Bruckner and released in 2017 on Netflix. Reuniting after the tragic death of their friend, Four college pals set out to hike through the Scandinavian wilderness. A wrong turn leads them into the mysterious forests of Norse legend, where an ancient evil exists and stalks them at every turn. I love this movie. I really do. I can't really explain why I love it so much, because believe me, it isn't a perfect masterpiece, but it just randomly burrowed itself into my heart. I think what really helped it is the experience I had watching it. One night I couldn't sleep so I got up and I set myself up on the sofa with this movie. The whole world was dark and silent except for the sounds of this film coming at me each and every way through my surround sound and in my sleep deprived state I was just so on edge as I could hear twigs cracking all around me. I was fully immersed in the environment of the movie with the characters. This may seem a bit of an odd addition to a summer horror movie list but it is first and foremost a camping horror movie list and this one absolutely fits the bill. In fact this one may satisfy those thoroughbred campers and walkers out there as there are plenty of tents, maps, and those tiny little stoves, walking sticks, you name it, it's got it. I've seen some describe this movie as boring in parts which in a small way I can understand but to me, in those moments, I just enjoyed the character-based action. The key event that leads our group of campers to the situation that they end up in is a really interesting one that allows for an exploration into grief, blame, cowardice and friendship, which I really enjoyed. I also really love the very British broing we have in this movie. I mean, it literally opens with them having pints in the pub. Obviously, it's a very specific type of British broing. It's not representing all British men. But still, I found it entertaining. And you've got some choice lines such as... 
Morning. Fuck me, it's cold. Quite frankly, right now, Sweden can lick my bridge. Lick your what? And Look, I'm not. I'm not going to plan a lads holiday over a f***ing avocado on toast, mate. I'm just... I'm but as slow as the first two acts of the ritual are, it makes up for it in the third act, where things get a little more balls to the wall bizarre. And there was one scene that really got under my skin and I had a very visceral reaction to. I'm looking at you, Hutch. Next up, we have The Blair Witch Project, directed by Daniel Myrick and released in 1999. Three film students travel to a small town to collect documentary footage about The Blair Witch, a local murderer. Over the course of several days, the students interview townspeople and gather clues to support the legends. But the project takes a frightening turn when the students lose their way in the woods and begin experiencing horrific noises and events. Look, I know that there's a mixed bag of opinions for this movie. It's a Marmite movie. People seem to either love it or hate it. On its release, it received mostly positive reviews, but has gone on to have what seems like less than positive. But you can't say it doesn't fit the purposes of this list. The Blair Witch Project is a lot like the ritual in that it's a mix of camping and walking. You've got tents, you've got maps, you've got the woods, you've got gross body fluids, and you've got people having a miserable time. I mean, that sounds like camping to me. I'm only kidding. The thing with the Blair Witch Project is that love it or hate it, or just apathetic for that matter, you can't deny that it was pretty groundbreaking on its release. This was back in the days before found footage had been absolutely played to death and it was a fresh way to tell a story and create scares. And I think that it does deliver on scares in a basic way. It plays on and explores our fear of the dark and things that go bump in the night. And it also does something that some other movies could take note of and it leaves things to the viewer's imagination. I think that what I imagine happened to Josh is probably far worse than anything they could have shown. I actually think that the way they marketed this movie was probably far more groundbreaking than the movie itself. It was the first time a movie had successfully used the internet as a marketing platform. They created a website, they handed out a missing person leaflet and used chat rooms and message boards to create rumours that the actors had actually gone missing. Next up, but last on our walking and tent camping, is the Wrong Turn reboot released in 2021. Jen and her friends set off on the Appalachian Trail and, despite repeated warnings, decide to stray off course. They soon encounter an isolated group of deadly mountain people. The Wrong Turn reboot was another movie that came out to mixed reviews. While the film has the same title as its predecessors in the franchise, this movie is definitely a hard reboot. It removed the cannibalistic mutated mountain men aspect and instead it chooses to comment on how people regularly make judgments about other people, whether that's their lifestyle, their education or their sexuality. With the change in style and change in antagonist, it's not hard to understand why people questioned why it was even called Wrong Turn, but it probably has something to do with the fact that it was written by Alan B. McElroy, who also wrote the 2003 original. I will say that the reason this movie is on this list is, um, aside from it being camping, it is hands down the most impressive film in the franchise visually. This is due in no small part to the gorgeous setting of the Appalachian Mountains. There are so many scenes in this movie that are just beautiful. There is one way, one very clear way, the reboot delivers on the wrong turn name, and that is with the kills. There's enough brutal gore to keep you gore hounds happy. I mean, while some of the movies on this list are quite lighthearted and even on the silly side, this is definitely one of the most brutal movies on the list. This one will satisfy those who wanted something a little bit darker from their horror. And our final movie on this list is The Strangers Pray at Night that was a sequel to The Strangers and was released in 2018. Mike and his wife Cindy take their son and daughter on a road trip that becomes their worst nightmare. The family members soon find themselves in a desperate fight for survival when they arrive at a, a secluded mobile home park that's mysteriously deserted until three masked psychopaths show up to satisfy their thirst for blood. Yep, we're finishing up our camping trip with a stop off at the trailer park or caravan park, again depending on what you call it. 
I'll be honest, I haven't seen the original The Strangers, but I still really enjoyed Pray at Night. While the story is pretty simple, I actually liked that. The idea of a bunch of dangerous killers just targeting you, well, just for the fun of it, is a really scary idea. And the fact that we don't ever get to know anything about this group of strangers, or even see their face in some cases, makes it even scarier rather than having everything over-explained away to us. I also thought the cast were great too. The core family felt really natural and believable and have some really good interactions together. I suppose you could say that the daughter could border on a caricature of a moody troubled teen at times, but I don't think it ever was too bad. And I think the use of the trailer park setting, the 80s soundtrack and that pool scene, um, make this one a great watch and I would highly recommend it. So there you have it guys, my list of top 10 camping horror movies. I'm sure I will have missed some of your favourite camping movies, um, but there, you know, there are some camping movies out there that I haven't watched yet and some that while I have watched them, I don't want to promote them here on this channel. I do love this subgenre though, so feel free to leave me some of your suggestions down in the comments. And don't forget to check out my top 10 summer horror movies if you haven't already. And don't forget to like and subscribe so that you don't miss out on any of my other top 10s. But in the meantime, thank you as always for stopping by. I really do appreciate it. Take care of yourselves and I will talk to you in the next episode. Bye guys.